Hey, what's up, guys? It is Dan from Fight Wave, and today I'm joined by somebody I'm incredibly excited to speak with. This is an interview I've been very excited to do for quite some time now, and if you know anything about me, you know I love myself a good women's flyweight matchup. In my opinion, the, my favorite division inside the UFC, and today's guest is no exception to the pecking order, guys. If you have been watching this division since its conception, you'll know today's guest is one of the most captivating female fighters, and just fighters, period, across the entirety of our sport. She's racked up some remarkable wins in UFC, starting her UFC career as early as 2 and 2 as a professional, which you can't really say for any other fighter, I think, in the flyweight division. She's been incredibly active. She's captivated hearts across the world with her ex exceptional grappling and really is making a push at only 28 years of age. The experience she has is remarkable. She's the pride of Port St. Lucie in Florida. She's the pride of Canada. I'm joined by the savage herself, Jillian Robertson. Jillian, how are we doing today? I'm like, wow, that was quite the intro. <laughs> right, we got to do it right for you, Jillian. You know, it's always got to be done right for our guests. I appreciate it. I'm doing great today. Like we were talking about earlier, just finished training, so it's always a good day when I can get my feet on the mats. No, yeah, absolutely, Jillian. And wasting no time in 2024, already victorious in one bout against Poliana Viana. You know, you, like you said, Canada brings out the knockout power, you know, of its stars, and you went into Canada and unfortunately delivered on a night where the men couldn't. You were, I think, the lone victor of the Canadians on that night. Uh, but, you know, talk to me about how you're feeling with this matchup against Michelle, uh, Michelle Watterson Gomez on June 1st. We had one other victor that night. Oh, uh, yeah. Ja Jasmine, Jasmine Justice of Vigius. Yep. I almost forgot. Both the females brought it home. Both the females carried. Uh, they, had to, they had to step up for the men. Exactly. But uh, this matchup against Michelle Watterson, I am so over the moon excited for it. This is exactly what I wanted. I wanted somebody with a number next to the name. I'm getting a huge vet in Michelle Watterson. So much respect to her. Just obviously, I've grown up watching her career. I feel like this is another... One of those moments for me where it's kind of like when your rivals, be when your idols become your rivals, like I'm finally stepping in the cage with someone that I've looked up to for a long time. And I'm so ready for this moment. So excited for this moment. I really feel like this is a huge opportunity for me. And it's like all eyes on me. I just got to perform. No, yeah, absolutely. And I love what you mentioned there with the idea of being this not being the first time of your idols becoming your rivals. You've really, I feel like as far as your UFC career has gone, I feel like you've done it all in such a short amount of time and you continue to kind of up the ante in terms of your career where you fought people you've looked up to. You mentioned Michelle Watterson. You know, you fought all the other prospects in the division. You fought, you know, people across the Ultimate Fighter, across, you know, submission grappling. You've done it all, Jillian, and in such a short amount of time, and still only 28, your prime, I feel like you're only still just settling into your prime you know five and one across all your last six uh competitions including grappling and mma you've really i feel like stepped into your footing as of late talk to me a little bit just about that mindset adjustment being able to find a really find your footing as of late and being able to kind of kind of troubleshoot in terms of your career being able to see what works what doesn't for you i feel like so much of my career was such a learning process as you stated like i got into the ufc very early and i also just I feel like me as a person who I am, I let other people control my career too much. So I was doing what everybody said was best for me. So if they said I need to do strength and conditioning, I'm doing strength and conditioning. If they say I need to do this, I'm doing this. If they say I need to take a fight, I'm taking a fight. And it's like now I feel like I'm taking the career into my own hands. I'm making my own decisions. I'm making my own training schedule. I'm deciding when I fight and I feel like that's the biggest factor. And even like going into my last loss, that was the biggest factor into it. I, I shouldn't have took that fight and I knew I shouldn't have taken that fight. And it was me not listening to myself is why I lost that fight. I had a, I'm like, it was just too quick of a turnaround. I had a terrible training camp and I knew the whole time I shouldn't be in there. So it's really just, I feel like that's really where the huge turnaround was, is me just taking control of my career and now I'm doing what I need to do and getting things done how I need it because every fighter is different and it's like you need to do what's best for you. No, yeah, definitely. Couldn't agree with that more. And I feel like we really saw that because prior to, you know, the move to Goat Shed, which we'll get into in just a moment, you know, you were kind of in a more reclusive reserve kind of training uh, regimen. You know, I know you and Hannah Goldie, Jose Shorty Torres, you had like your little core group of, of fighters you guys would work with. And then as of late, you know, training at Goat Shed under coach Asim Zaidi, he's been really, you know, a trailblazer in the space as of late. He's kind of been a very vocal figure. We've seen kind of come out of the blue really in all honesty but he's really cultivated a really solid core following and i think it's just been a remarkable to see 
what he's been able to bring to the space. I want to ask you, just in terms of making that adjustment, switching the new gym uh, to Goat Shed, what's that experience been like, and how has it been training with Awesome and then also other female fighters that come there, like Eileen Perez, who also is a regular there? Okay, Goat Shed is definitely, it's a home for me. You know, I love it more than anything else. Dean Thomas, he's been my head coach since day one, since we're working 13 years together now. I'm like, uh, started at his gym when I was 16 years old. So I'm like, Dean's still a huge part of my career. He still comes down, game plans for me, works with me, uh, drills with me a lot. But as you said, Awesome is a, the, he's the leader of the Goat Shed. He's the head and He's absolute. He's on top of everything, whether it's go shed or karate combat. And he's on top of it. So, awesome. It's been a pleasure to work with Awesome. We've been, I've been there for a little bit over a year now, and I, it, like I said, it's my home. I love go shed. No, yeah, definitely. And I wanted to ask you, like, because you mentioned that dynamic, and I think it's a really interesting dynamic. Well. We've seen a lot of other fighters, they've kind of been unsuccessful in trying to incorporate a new gym and like a longtime head coach and being able to do it at a high level. But I feel like for you, your last fight, it was anything but that because you looked absolutely remarkable with having both Dean and Awesome in the corner, both of them really being able to bounce off each other. I feel like just uh, the misconceptions about Awesome as a coach have not been short. It's just been a lot, but... You know, he's really a professional. I feel like he does a really good job with his athletes. So just talk to me about that dynamic going into the Poliana fight. And in my opinion, putting a stamp on the division, putting the division on notice and saying, hey, like, I know people in the past have maybe been kind of more open to fighting me, but I am a force to be reckoned with in this division. And this is the type of performances I can put on when I'm on my game. I think I found the perfect mix, honestly. Like, I feel like Goat Shed with Awesome, with Dean, it's everything that I need to be a world champion. And it's just, I need fighting at 115. I need a little bit of space in between fights. That was the, I, I feel like that I honestly will stick by. That's the only reason for my last loss. And you guys will see that it'll just keep on going up. I'm like, cause I, I feel like my, my opening into 115 division, this is what I said. We had a little hiccup, but you won't see it again. I'm like, I'm just going up and up from here. No, yeah, definitely. And the last time out, Julian, you know, in Canada, in your home, in your home country, you know, being able to go out there and put a performance for the fans uh, on what was like we mentioned uh, jokingly, like otherwise a very gloomy night for the Canadian fans, uh, quite a stark parallel to UFC 289, but still nonetheless. Canadian MMA has looked the best it's ever looked right now. You know, with you and Jasmine Jasudovicius at the forefront, both of you guys are doing remarkable things on the on the females mixed martial arts front, and then we got on the men's mixed martial arts front. Just so many guys like Michael Malad, Charles Jordan. You've got you know the likes of Kyle Nelson, who's really picked things up as of late. It just looks like Canada as a whole is really finding its footing in MMA again post GSP era. Talk to me a little bit about just that. The kind of badge of is there any like badge of responsibility in you kind know, of representing Canadian MMA and just being able to represent your country at the highest level and get that love that you've been getting over the last two years or so since it's really picked up. There's nothing better than being able to represent Canada. Being able, to, my two performances in Canada, I've said it both times, and like just the energy in there. There's nothing that can compare to that. I literally have to reel myself in like pre-fight, me walking out into that arena. There's so much energy. Everybody's screaming, everything like that. I'm like, Jillian, focus. You still have to fight. You have a you have a goal in front of you. Like we have to stay focused. I just absolutely love being in front of the Canadian crowd. I feel like even that, like the support of the Canadian crowd in MMA that you're seeing now is absolutely insane. But to see the fighters come up, I really think we're not far away from another Canadian champ. No, yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, with with the talent that's coming out of Canada right now. It's just been amazing to see how far it's come. And I want to ask you, you know, you mentioned kind of the chills of walking into the octagon and seeing the loud Canadian crowd. I was surprised because I did not think Canada had that in their bag of just being able to, uh, you know, rep pull out uh, pull out a crowd like that. I really did not think it, to, like, you know, it's been such a long time since we've seen a large Canadian crowd like that since, you know, I think it was uh, the Holloway-Edgar card, if I remember correctly, where Max Holloway fought in Toronto. You know, I don't think we've seen a turnaround like that in ages in Canada. But talk to me about is was there any moment outside of the cage, you know, that really stood out to you as, you know, Canadian fans approaching you or just being able to see people who recognize you in Canada and how far the sport has come? It's funny because uh, the Holloway Edgar card is the one that I fought Sarah Proto on, too. So that was my other uh, performance in Canada as well. But, um, yeah, it's just it's honestly I you really can't compare to fighting in, in front of your hometown crowd. and. It's honestly, I love the energy regardless. I loved when I fought Molly McCann in Liverpool and everybody booed me. I love that too. You know, it's still, it's a great feeling 
just having that crowd there, having the energy there, anything but the apex for me, for me. But, but nothing can, absolutely nothing can compare to a hometown crowd. Nothing can compare to that support. Just from the be very beginning, from the second you walk out, you know, like everybody's backing you. Everybody loves you. Everybody wants to, wants to see you succeed. And you just, you can't compare it to this feeling, man. <laughs> no, I, I could not agree more. And I love that you mentioned the apex because I actually will ask you that next. You know, obviously the apex has been such a polarizing figure as of late to have a lot of fight nights there. It's kind of a give or miss for a lot of fighters. Some fighters love it because the opportunities are a little bit more extensive, especially if, it, if it's a downer card, they're able to fight. And if they perform, the opportunity of getting a 50k bonus is higher. But, you know, it's I've heard a lot of fighters be very critical. They're like, hey, why are we still at the apex? Like, it's time to go back into stadiums regularly, full time. You know, what would you say is the biggest takeaway in terms of not just your performances, but also just the mindset of fighting on an apex card as opposed to a crowd? Is there anything not necessarily that you do differently from a training standpoint, but from a mental standpoint, kind of the preparation? Uh, preparation, preparation wise, no, not necessarily, but just. I guess the experience of it all is just completely different. Uh, like I said, even just like walking out, even though it makes it harder to stay focused, it's just that energy gives you, I don't know, it gives you a different kind of focus in there almost. I feel like it's its almost, it feels like you're not in a fist fight. It, it's, it's weird. It's a weird scenario because the room's like quiet. The room's silent. So it's like, it's almost too chill of a scenario to be in a fist fight. It's just, it's a weird scenario. I Yeah, I'm obviously not a huge fan of the Apex. I love having the arenas. I love having the crowd there. I love having fans there. But um, yeah, it's a really weird scenario. Just, and it's like, even think about your victories. You win and you get your hand raised and it's like, you're cheering for yourself. Like, there's not really anybody else there. No, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you've you fought and, you know, grappled in arenas across the globe. And I know more recently you had a really unique experience with Montana De La Rosa and, and grappling in the karate combat pit, which is, you know, awesome. Has done a great job there. You know, karate combat's really taken things off. It's just been awesome to see. And I know you've had a lot of different grappling experiences across the world. And you go to competitions regularly. What's it been like for you? you you've spoken recently about, you know, I think it was fighters who will train something for a long time and then they'll kind of try to stray away from it in, in an attempt to really you know try to fix a flaw in their game rather than improve what they already have and also you know just to appease the fans whereas you you've always stuck to your core of grappling and really you haven't tried to deviate from it. if it works for you you've stuck to it talk to me a little bit about just the experience of being able to really continuously improve your grappling and just the absolute explosion with ADC, ADCC, Fight Pass Invitational, all these different grappling formats, Fury Grappling, all of these different formats kind of coming up as of late and really elevating the grappling world. Oh, it's so awesome to see, especially for the Nogi world. It's really just blown up in the last couple of years. And it's so awesome to see that it's actually an avenue for athletes to make money now too, for people who are just jujitsu athletes. But I love to be able to like, I guess, like cross compete. I love to be able to get on the jujitsu mats. It's obviously it, it's where my first love is I feel like I am almost I, I feel like I'm leaning a little bit more I'm becoming too much of an MMA fighter I'm, uh, I'm like I'm getting in these grappling matches and like with Montana I'm sitting in mount and I'm like all right I can't elbow her in the face what do we do now <laughs> but I it, regardless I still like the jujitsu matches I love doing them and I love that jujitsu is becoming such a huge thing no, yeah, definitely. And I want to give a little bit of acknowledgement to you and just how far you've come. And I think credit to all the, the female fighters, because going back to the first point that I made, you know, you started your MMA career very early within the UFC at a professional record of two and two. And on top of that, you know, they, you, there's the infamous Dana White speech from the Ultimate Fighter where he speaks about women, uh, you know, um, competing in MMA. He said for some time it would never happen. And then it ended up happening. And I feel like right now, uh, it's kind of a very heartwarming situation or not kind of it is a very heartwarming situation with what just the women in combat sports have been able to do in such a short time you know from making their voices heard in grappling to making their voices heard in mixed martial arts i know people like to criticize or make crack jokes but i really do believe that it's come such a far way a long way in such a short amount of time and i wanted to ask you just in terms of any kind of responsibility on your end you know just in terms of this kind of inner want because i feel like you've done a remarkable job of bringing up the women's grappling world, women's mixed martial arts world. And with people like Jillian Robertson at the forefront, we wouldn't see this sport come as far as it has. So talk to me about just your biggest takeaways of the evolution for women in combat sports as of the past 10 years. 
Gosh, I appreciate that. I'm like, I don't even look at myself like that. I look at women like, like Ronda Rousey, like she opened the doors for us. And like, how long ago was that? Like, I want to say it's less than 10 years. Uh, but like uh, people like her, it's like, like you said, like Dana said that women would never fight in the UFC. I feel like it's girls like her that you, it's impossible not to respect. Like she opened the doors for us completely. Even this uh, Michelle Watterson, who I'm about to fight, she was the Invicta Adam Wayne champ coming over uh, to the UFC. She's a veteran in her own right. I'm like, a lot of these girls really opened the doors. When I was an amateur, I remember watching Ronda. And it's like, she's probably the reason why I even continue training. It's like, who's to say if I fought for a year or two and then was like, all right, there's nothing to do with this. There's no way I'm going to make money. Let's do something realistic with my life. You know? So it's like, I really think that it's like women like that, that we have to be thankful for. And to see the evolution of, like you said, like over the years, even to see champions go from Ronda to champions like Amanda, who I think can be held on the same plane as any male champion. She was so technical, so well-rounded. Had every woman, the second she touched them with her hands, was scared of her. You could see it in their eyes. Amanda is just a monster in her own right. And I feel like you're just seeing the evolution of women getting better, more well-rounded, and really competing technically with the guys no yeah definitely and something i wanted to highlight i don't know that the ufc brass and the ufc fan base is ready for this but it's an interesting proposal nonetheless and julian i would love to get your thoughts on it you know one championship recently did something that i think was really remarkable and absolutely incredible i don't think we've ever seen a promotion do anything like it and they had an international women's day card headline and they've done it prior but that they've had a card that was headlined and consisted of solely female champions and female fighters, and it was absolutely remarkable to see, you know, fighters like Janet Todd, Patizia, Alicia, Helen Rodriguez, and, you know, so many other fighters, you know, just be able to take the main stage and garner that kind of respect. I want to pitch to you, if you had to be a matchmaker on a UFC card where you have to make a all-women's fight night or pay-per-view and put it in front of the fans, who would be your headliner? Headliner, I think you'd have to go with uh, Wei Li versus Grasso. No, yeah, definitely. I feel like make it a super fight headliner there. No, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just in terms of how far it's come, and you mentioned, you know, Michelle Waterson and Daniel Kelly. If I remember correctly, they were both actually, you know, even like ring girls for the promotions that they were representing. And then they eventually tra transcended beyond that role and just went into the grappling department for Danielle Kelly and also Michelle Waterson with the career she's had. And, you know, I want to thank you so much for your time, Jillian, and just the opportunity to speak with you. You've done nothing short of remarkable things. You're five and one in your last, last six competitions, as I mentioned. You've got, you're riding a pretty remarkable win streak right now in the UFC with wins over Piera Rodriguez, you know, Priscilla Cachoeira. You've got Maria Agapova on there and then Pollyanna Viana. You know, I think it's about time, like you mentioned, you know, to take that next step and talk to me a little bit about the fight with Michelle and also your goals for 2024. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm super excited about this fight with Michelle, and I feel like everybody knows the direction that uh, I want to take it in. Uh, it's a, I, I think it's a fairly obvious striker versus grappler matchup, the karate hottie versus my jujitsu. Uh, I I'm obviously neck hunting, throat hunting all the time. I'm calling it round two, rear naked choke always. Um, I feel like round two is where I shine. I'm always getting my finishes round two, and um, What's next for me is I hope I, sh I maybe get a one more in by December. If not, then early next year. But uh, like I said, with this cut to 115, I have to take a little bit longer in between fights. But uh, I think I might be able to get one more in before the end of the year. No, yeah, absolutely. And I can't wait to watch you fight come June 1st. Jillian, thank you so much for your time. To the fans at home watching, do be sure to check out Jillian Robertson against Michelle Watterson Gomez. You know, it's going to be a remarkable fight. And I think it's going to be one that's going to captivate the audience from, you know, bell to bell or as long as it goes. Like Jillian said, round two, rear naked choke, the throat snatcher, as they like to call it. You know, it's going to be an exciting fight. Check her out on social media. I will be linking her social medias in the description down below. And as I said at the beginning of the interview, guys, the pride of Canada, the pride of Port St. Lucie in Florida, Jillian Robertson, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. It's been me, Dan from Fight Wave, signing out.